Hello again. This week we're going to look at some of the anatomy around the deep hips and the lateral rotators or external rotators, depending on what you call them. So we all know about the famous ones, you know, the big ones, if you like, um, and those will include structures like gluteus maximus, gluteus minimus, gluteus medius, and of course the infamous or famous piriformis. Let's talk about piriformis for a minute because there's an awful lot of talk around this idea of piriformis and piriformis syndrome. And it was first mentioned as far back as 1928 when someone suggested that perhaps the piriformis wasn't receiving sufficient attention in relation to sciatic pain. The idea became more popular when people started looking at cadavers as a result and seeing that indeed the sciatic nerve does run underneath the piriformis muscle and so two and two became uh, 22. Now it is true that the sciatic nerve does run under the piriformis and so you can see why it's attractive to think in this way but there's an awful lot of other things that could be the reason for the type of pain that you know piriformis type syndrome is. As with lots of these kind of thing, a raft of tests have emerged, focusing on uh, testing for the problem, and of course, you know, lots of treat pro pre treatment protocols as well, aiming to release the piriformis, and you know my views on releasing anything. So we have uh, the Faber test and the FAIR test and the piriformis stretch and so on and so forth. If any of these were just testing the piriformis in isolation, then this might be okay. But of course, there are lots of other structures involved in all of these tests that will all have contributing factors. It's this oft repeated notion of one muscle doing one thing in isolation or being responsible for one thing in isolation that is so much of the problem that we have in anatomy. But piriformis syndrome is controversial, not least because the idea of the sciatic nerve under pressure from this muscle isn't really borne out in what we can see in the evidence. Now, there's also been lots of suggestions of the sciatic nerve going through the piriformis along with some um, other anatomical variations in some people. But again, these haven't been supported by imaging or even during surgery when you, you, know, you can actually see the muscle and the path of the nerve. In dissection, I've never seen a sciatic nerve going through the piriformis as um, sometimes is stated as a variation. That doesn't mean to say it doesn't or never happens, it's just that in the dissections I've done, I've never seen it. Generally speaking, we're saying that the type of pain we're looking at is buttock pain that can radiate into the hip or upper leg. We might also see some restriction in external rotation and a tightness in the lower back, um, and this is the kind of thing that goes alongside that kind of pain. Now, I'm not saying that piriformis isn't in there or involved as part of the problem, it's just that it's worth considering the other quite enormous structures that are all involved and join up in here. The head of the hamstrings, for instance, has this big bursa-type structure sitting around the top of it, and it joins up to the fascia of the gluteus maximus. The combination of these tissues is you know, often forgotten about, and the idea of you know, hamstring tension continuing into the sacrum is instead you know, a big focus, especially on things like the anatomy trains theory, which is another story. It is something that I actually missed for years until I read a piece of research about uh, the structures around the hip. But it goes back to my old complaint of you know, finding a muscle in an anatomy book and fixating on that structure alone. Obturator internus is another muscle that could easily be involved in any of this kind of presentation, uh, the buttock pain, and one that seems to get completely overlooked, mostly because people haven't heard of it. So when somebody has pain on actively rotating their hip externally, then I suggest that logically obturator internus um, is probably more likely to be involved in piriformis. And I'll talk a bit more about obturator in a second. There are also some other really interesting bits to think about up in around this hip and the top of this femur. In particular, the space that runs between the head of the femur and the rest of the pelvis, the, um, the ischiofemoral space between here and here. And this is the location of around the back here is the quadriceps femoris. Um, and a lot of people, interestingly enough, have been found uh, to have an over, when they, you know, when there's a lot of signaling in, in MRI, the quadratus femoris is um, over signaling or over contracted. Um, these people have been shown to have a, a narrower, uh, a narrow, narrower than normal ischiofemoral femoral space. I, I'm interested in structures 
like that, but also things like the obturator and turnus because they seem to form a, a grouping that is common when you see things appearing around the hip and around the lower leg. I've mentioned before in previous videos that muscles tend not to be considered or their function tends not to be considered when they come together to form a group, you know, such as uh, pes and serinus. And I, I've never really worked out why this is the case. The grouping that I'm talking about here specifically is the grouping of the uh, muscles known as the gemelli with the relationship with their uh, obturator internus. So the obturator internus acts as a strong stabilizer of the hip uh, and the head of the femur. Um, and it seems like the gemelli, this sort of pair above and below, act as a pair of levers or strong guards uh, around that muscular tissue of the obturator as it sort of heads inside the pelvis. So gemelli comes from uh, the word Gemini, the, the, the twins, and there are two of them, the gemelli superior and gemelli inferior. Um, and um, obturatus, in, obturatus internus is a structure that goes inside and covers the entire surface of the pelvis. We have this obturator foramen, and obturator foramen means closed opening, and you know, that's its literal meaning. And it's there to absorb the, the load onto the, uh, the pelvis, the issue. And the obturator muscle, is, see that here, sort of sitting um, on the, it's gonna close that inside of this hole in the pelvis, and there'll be a membrane in there as well that, that's part of that uh, closing structure. Um, the obturator externus is on around the back, it's sort of part of the um, gluteal grouping, if you like, and it's on the inside of the femur as well. And um, it also has the obturator nerve involved, so it's another thing to think about when we have this kind of thing, so deep structures. Now we can even think about things like tensor fasciolatus, so tensor fasciolatus coming up um, across the top of the, uh, the leg, I've got left and got right on there just to remind me around the top of the pelvis. It creates a huge tension down the side of the leg. Um, and so anything along that's creating pressure and tension into here is also worth considering. Now I'll often find that people stand in external rotation with their foot slightly pointed out as normal, you know, just standing there. Um, and that's to be more stable. So you can try this yourself. If you just stand with your feet slightly apart and if you lean or put your weight onto one side, you'll find that you tend not to feel very stable. You know, the feeling is you're gonna fall over. Feeling being stable or not falling over is hugely important to us as humans. If you've ever fallen over in public and you feel horribly embarrassed by it, then you, the feeling that you have isn't really perhaps commensurate with severity of what happened. You just fell over. The thing is, is that if we as humans fall over, then, you know, certainly in the distant past, then it's game over for us, you know, from a biological evolutionary standpoint. And once we're down, something is going to come and kill us and eat us. And, or perhaps somebody else is going to come and kill us. Maybe they'll eat us in the past. I, I don't know. But either way, falling over is, is a huge weakness. And really, it's not something we can allow happen to ourselves. It's important, therefore, that we do anything we can to stabilize ourselves at all costs. All we then simply have to do from here to feel more stable is to simply turn our foot out, there we go, 45 degrees, um, into external rotation, and then, hey presto, we feel more stable. Of course, externally rotating the foot, you know, the foot is also gonna externally rotate the hip, it's gonna create load and pressure through the area, and, and this is going to refer as tightness, potential pain, because we've loaded it and put more connective tissue down into it. All the structures we've been talking about could be involved in, in all of this function um, and however slight. And it's not reasonable to think that the piriformis is more involved than anything else. When you look at it in dissection, piriformis is often quite small and people are pretty disappointed. You know, they've been really keen and excited to see it. And then when they finally saw it, they were disappointed and surprised to see how small and unimpressive it was. We're, we're talking about the piriformis here. You have to bear in mind that this piriformis muscle is stuck underneath, stuck fast underneath this huge area of glute max. Um, and this is the, one of the biggest, with the biggest muscle in the body. And it's got loads of fibers and a, a huge number of motor units. We talked about motor units. But it's really worth looking at whether this big chunk of meat um, is doing its job properly before we go into sort of skinny little things that are underneath it. The first thing I'm gonna look at with anyone that's presenting with pain, sciatic type pain, buttock pain like this is whether they are sitting on something. I know that sounds silly, but it used to be a wallet. Sometimes it's a lumpy chair or um, the way that they drive. You know, you'd be surprised at how many people used to be sitting on their wallets. I think the days of the wallet 
possibly gone with, you know, we can pay for everything on our phones now. So maybe there's less buttock pain. I don't know. So certain positions sitting in the car, sitting for extended time with the legs crossed. Um, these are all areas to look at when this kind of pain presents itself. I have to declare an interest here in as much as Avatarita internus is my favorite muscle of all time and it's beautiful and it really doesn't get the attention it deserves both from a functional and from an aesthetic perspective so there we go lots to think about as far as the hip and this whole area is concerned i'm going to be doing a webinar specifically about this going into a deep dive looking at dissection and uh, some um, practical aspects as well so check out the website join me on that and in the meantime please leave any comments you have in the section below and also please Please, please, please don't forget to like, subscribe and share and do all those things we're supposed to do on social media. And I will see you next time.